everyone. Welcome to today's episode of Decisions Now. I am your host, Erin Pearson, along with uh, Rigby Chavala. Um, we are very excited today. We have Prashant Sazakal um, joining us. He is the founder of the DBT Institute, which is a data and analytics consulting firm. He is an author and also an adjunct professor of data analytics at the IE Business School. So Prashant, Center. great to Thanks, have Prashant. you. Welcome. My pleasure, Erin. Thanks for the opportunity and glad to talk to you guys. Awesome. So Prashant, just to, to, to get us started today, we're going to talk a lot about um, like how to actually find actionable insights in data analytics. It's something that we've talked a lot about on our other podcasts is what people are doing, how they're acting on them, but really trying to drill down into how people can actually do this for themselves. So as we're jumping in here today, can you just help set some context and what exactly is an insight in the data and analytics? Um, yeah, context? sure. You know, the whole purpose of data analytics is to ask the relevant questions so as to gain insights to facilitate decision making. So the insights are crucial when you are talking about decision making. Now, the, coming to your point, what exactly is an insight? So insight, when you look from the data and analytics perspective, it is basically patterns. Specifically, it's about correlations, it's about relationship, inferences, outliers, predictions, so on and so forth, which will help me make a decision if I had known if I had not known it earlier. It is that unknown factor which I didn't have that information before. Now I got it. Now what are the other factors which I have to consider to make a better decision? So it is that X factor, the unknown factor which will help me make a better decision. Say, for example, I moved from India to Calgary in 2009. If somebody had told me that, hey, Prashant, buy a property in uh, Vancouver instead of Calgary, it would have been much better for me, right? So instead, no, I didn't have that insight. Now I have to work even now. I'm not uh, still in my retirement uh, thing. So that's the insight, which is that X factor, the unknown factor, which we uh, which we lack. And when it comes to data and analytics, broadly, these insights have been class can be classified into two major types. One is the performance insights, which is basically about knowing, okay, I didn't know who are my top five customers were which was a top five GL accounts where my spend was happening, so on and so forth. One is all about performance insights. But performance insights per se will not give you much information. You need to transform that into actionable insights. So that's where the real value for the companies are. Like I was working for a few retailer and we did a project where we said, we are going to classify all the SKUs, the stock keeping unit into four categories, A, B, C, and D. A category items are fast moving and D category items are slow moving. So we came up with a report uh, saying that these 15 items for the last 12 weeks, they were consistently marked as category D. So the territory managers were very excited. They said, tell me more about this. Which are these 15 items which are, uh, which are marked as class D for the last 12 weeks? When we presented those insights, they said, this is amazing. We have been asking for these insights for a very long time. Nobody provided this. Thank you very much. Okay, now what next? So what next? So one, I told them that I am not a uh, territory manager, but my common sense tells me that you need to terminate the contracts with those vendors who are supplying Part D items. They said, hold on, we can't do this. Why? We have signed a multi-year contract with those people. If you have to break the contracts, we need to pay them the penalties. So on one hand, you had great insights, which is a performance insight, which gave them the uh, opportunity to see who are the top 15 vendors and which are the top uh, Class D items, so on and so forth. But what do we do with those inf uh, with those insights? You're not able to go forward because you don't have that commitment or no, the leadership to transform uh, from performance fact, insights into know, an actionable uh, insight. Most of the customers we deal with really struggle with the transition from insights to actionable insights, like you mentioned, right? Um, I mean, to your point, you know, I can see two thousand dashboards every day, but what am I supposed to do yeah. next, right? And in, in your example too. Uh, you know, if the answer was you need to go terminate these contracts, who is that domain expert that can make that call, right? And and how do you how do you enable them to say, okay, here's option A and here's option B, right? That you you, yeah. you can go renegotiate the contract perhaps instead of terminating, right? Uh, but so so I guess you know if you just look at the evolution of yeah. just big data in general, yeah. um, we all started off with understanding data, creating some of these insights. That was what the initial wave of big data was. Um, now we're more in the decisioning uh, or in enabling decisions from those insights. So where do you see that 
trend and have you like any examples of customers that have successfully implemented this at a at a uh, at scale right meaning not like in your case right or in your example you're the expert consultant going and helping on a specific use case but how does the organization help themselves to do this <clears throat> Perfect. Yeah. So a great question, uh, Rick. So coming back to where I left earlier, which is about insights, and I discussed about the two major types of insights, which is performance and uh, actionable. So the value for the business is basically actionable insights. How do you make something actionable? So in my view, there are three criteria which the companies can choose to make those insights as actionable. The first one is look at those factors which are under your influence and control. Like, for example, I'm coming up with great insights, but if you can't do anything about it, so there is nothing to do about it. Like, for example, I was work consulting for an oil company and we had a team which was churning out the prediction for crude oil. So if you are sitting in a corner of the world and churning out predictions for crude oil, who cares? Because what there are banks which are doing it, there are consulting companies which are doing it, there's IEA which are doing it. So your prediction about the crude oil prices will not make any impact. Now, what is it under your influence and control? Instead, look at those factors like networking capital, which is under influence and control because you can do something on the cost of goods sold, on the inventory, on the asset reliability, and so on and so forth. All those factors are under your influence and control. And on top of it, this kind of networking capital prediction, nobody is doing outside the organization. You have to do it inside for a company for yourself. So the first factor is look at the ones which are under your influence and control. That's number one. Next, number two, we often, one of the, one of the uh, kind of uh, mistakes I would say most companies do, mm -hmm. it start at the first phase of the decision life cycle, which is data acquisition. I'm not saying that that's bad, but spare a thought on the last stage of the decision life cycle. Start with the end in mind. That means look at the decisions and see mm -hmm. for this decision to happen, what is the data that I need? Don't do the other way around all the time. You need both of them, but spare a thought on the last stages of the, of the life cycle as well. Start from the end in mind. So that's number two, which is decisioning. What information I need to do better decisioning. And the third thing is, do I have the resources in my, in my, with me to make it happen? Do I have the time? Do I have the money? Do I have the labor? Do I have the skills? And do you have the data? Because data is also a resource, <laughs> in my view. So these are the three major criteria, I would say, to transform from performance insights into actionable insights. Again, number one, factors under your influence and control. Start with decision in mind. And next, number three, identify those resources, whether you, are, uh, whether you can do it. Like, for example, leadership is also a resource. You are coming up with amazing insights, but if the senior management is not geared to support us, there's no point in doing uh, uh, in doing this analytics, for example. Yeah, well, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, but one of the questions I would have to drill into this is certainly when you're starting with the what is the intended outcome, I think there's a bigger question of who is the intended outcome for also because each function that you're working with is going to have a slightly different outcome and what's going to actually impact them. Um, so when you're starting with that, and also then when you're looking at the resources, when you look at it from a DA, a data analytics perspective, um, I think a lot of times you're working with very technical people. Uh, you're working with a lot of data scientists, data engineers. Um, and then when you're trying to actually make it actionable, it then you move the data from this more technical construct to a more business construct as well. And you get different personalities and how do people understand and interpret the data to make it actionable or whose job is it to translate it from these, um, from like the more technical side of the data science to the actual um, insight. So could you talk a little bit about how do you make it actionable for these cross-functional teams? Great uh, question, Erin. So I use a framework in my, uh, in my projects, what I call it as the MAT framework, which stands for That's a good name. <laughs> which stands for monitor, analyze, and details. So, what does this mean? We all talk about insights. The CEO, the C-suite talks about insights. The director talks about insights. The analyst talks about insights. But the insight needs for each of them is completely different. The CEO's insights needs are very different from that of a manager. The manager's insights needs are very different from that of an analyst. 
So what are those insights? The CEO looks at a dashboard. He looks at a KPIs. Whereas the manager or a director looks at an aggregation of information, like the BI reports, for example, which is typically aggregated. And the analyst looks at line item by line item. I want to know in this purchase order for this line item, what was the span, so on and so forth. So when you talk about when you talk about insights, the first thing which you need to do is who are your insight consumers? and identify the persona so that you are better able to craft those insights and there are no paradoxes and so on and so forth which are which which are associated with the deriving the insights so the first thing is apply the math framework because everybody is talking about insights so you need to identify whose insights needs are you addressing here so that's number one uh, here the second thing which which i also seen many times is people want to derive insights but at the same time spare a thought on why you need this insights. What will happen if you don't have this insights? Many times we want insights. Now, if I give you this insights, what will you do with this? And what will you lose if I don't if you don't have this insights? And the third point which I have which I've seen is it's great to have insights, but who is accountable for this? Who is who takes the ownership in transforming those insights into decisions? For instance, I was working for a utility and we came up with this amazing insight saying that if you do this, tuck, 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 you will save $8 million a year. So this looks like a great insight. Everybody was in uh, agreement, but the plant manager who was supposed to do this was not in agreement because he was not empowered to do all those things. So other thing is we ought to know the uh, accountability, the ownership, because then that's where the resources and the, that's where the rubber hits the road, so on and so forth. So it's a couple of things, the mad framework, why you want to know what you what will you lose if you don't have this and the third thing is accountability and ownership for those insights and ultimately we talk about data and analytics often from a technology perspective when i go to my clients <laughs> the most often times i ask i get a question do you need to do you need to hire a python developer or do, or do you need somebody from phd in computer science so the first thing that people have to understand with data analytics is it's about people it's about change so that's a fundamental thing of data analytics. All those things are secondary. It's right. important. Python and, is and, important. Uh, Maths know, is important. Uh, data is important. But they, they'll come, uh, they'll those come me. later. Uh, you know, when, when, when you take uh, a cohort of data engineers and data scientists, right, they're always looking at ways to solve problems without knowing the impact. So in other words, uh, if like I think you said, right, if you didn't do it, what's the... What's the loss? And if you didn't do that analysis, uh, typically most teams focus on the low hanging fruit because they just want to get things done, show progress, show some success along the way. But if you go the low hanging fruit route, your impact, uh, the real impact to the organization comes much, much, much later, right? Versus you flip the order, you understand your persona, uh, figure out the use cases, which has the highest impact. Yeah. Then you work backwards and only get those data. So you're not wasting time getting insights that no one's going to use, right? Uh, so that, that, that's that's a that's a great pointer to that, you know. And and I think we Absolutely. talked about this Absolutely. in one of our previous conversations. 100%. And you mentioned the term data literacy, which kind of stuck with me. So you know, like, can you expand on what data literacy at an organization level means? Yeah. So, you know, but what I see in my consulting projects or talking to clients, prospects and uh, and all those people uh, is how do you make this change happen? And often we think in data analytics, we need uh, we need technology, we need data. But I go a step further. I see the first thing is you don't need technology. You don't even need data. The biggest thing for change is education, which I call it as data literacy. So how do you, so that's the most important thing. How do you interpret this uh, information and consume it? Let me give you an example of how uh, uh, about this data literacy. So I say analytics building blocks are four major things. One is data, next is algorithm, which is an engine which turns out insights. But most often there are other two components which people miss out. Number two, assumptions. Number three, assumptions. And the number four is ethics. So when I talk to assumptions as to my clients, they get very nervous. What are you talking about? Why is assumptions coming into the picture? Because the business is an evolving entity and data is always a record of the past event. 
So, for example, I, there's a quote which I, which I, which a VP of an utilities company told me: "We run business every day, but I get my reports every quarter. Why is that? Because there is always a lag between data capture, data processing, and data consumption, so on and so forth." So, coming back to your point, Reg, is about the four key building blocks, which is data, algorithms, assumptions, and uh, and ethics. So how do you build data literacy? So when I talk about assumptions, people who have very low literacy levels, they get very nervous and they think data analytics is all about black and white. You feed data into an algorithm so you get insights, you just do it. But there's a lot of subjectivity associated with this. And how do you complement the missing data when you have to take decisions today based on a report which you are getting even two days earlier? Because businesses change. Mergers and acquisitions, divestitures, new product introduction, COVID, regulations, so on and so forth. The business is in a constant change of flux. So one of the things is to use this assumptions to make it to supplement the missing data which you have, which could be group thinking, subject matter experts, analyst reports, so on and uh, and uh, and so forth. So one of the again, people have to understand that data analytics number one is not black and white, and that comes with uh, with uh, with literacy or education. In my company, we have identified 11 competencies and 41 sub-competencies within data literacy for companies to uh, become data literate. Uh, so it's all about education. It's all about change. And education is the biggest that's enabler for change. In my view, the biggest <laughs> ROI anybody can get is through education <laughs> and vacations and vacations. <laughs> I bet that's, that sounds like it's quite a comprehensive course um, that you have there as well. Um, so... <laughs> One of the things um, to actually put together these actionable insights to put the assumptions in, but to also really understand what people need and what the different functions that you're serving um, are needing and what's going to be the impact of what you're putting together is um, a decision statement as well. So you need to figure out what are you actually going to get out of it? So what would you actually tie into? How would you craft something that would be a complete decision statement that people could then take to get to the outcome that is look, that you're excellent, looking for. Excellent. Excellent question, uh, Aaron. So uh, if I look at a decision, formulating a decision statement, it has got, the first thing is before I formulate the decision statement, decisions come only when there are options, only when there are alternatives. If there are no alternatives, just like Nike says, just do it. There is no decisions. You just do it. So decisions come only when there are choices, alternatives, options, so on and so forth. So with that background, I would say a decision statement is based on four major things. The first thing is an objective statement. And in my view, an objective statement to make it, it's very easy actually. Uh, it's take your wish list and put a location and put a time frame to this. So that becomes a goal statement or an objective statement. Take your goal statement to, to your wish list, put a location and put a time so you, you, you uh, that becomes an objective statement. That's number one. Next, number two is alternatives. So decision comes only when there are alternatives. Now, for example, I want to increase my monthly recurring revenue. So what do I do? One thing, you sell more products, you sell, find more clients, you uh, improve your cash flow, so on and so forth. So these are different alternatives which you have, which will help you grow the company. So one, now I want to pick the best one out of these three options. So how do I do this? That's where data and analytics come into the picture, which is in the world of decision science, it's called as payoff. Payoff is the link between data science and decision science. So the third component in the decision uh, table or decision statement has to be the payoff. And lastly, the outcomes. What is the outcomes that are going to happen? What is the best case? All those things about sensitivity analysis, scenario planning, and all those things. So when I look at a decision statement, I'm looking at four major components. Number one, objectives. Next, number two, alternatives. Number no, three, mean, payoffs. I'm, I'm, next it's number a four, very good outcomes. framework. I, I've never heard of that before uh, in that way. Uh, so, so then you know you might end up with alternatives that have the same payoff. It, that's is that why you have the fourth component, where then you look at the sensitivity of the change or whatever, and then make a make a trade off, perhaps. Yeah, so yeah, it could be possible mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, the trade-offs, they could be based on those alternatives. You come up with the criteria. What are the criteria you are looking for in these alternatives? And you might come up with the same thing. That's where the uh, the realized part of the decision, you bring different perspectives uh, to, uh, uh, from the team and uh, and say which is the best uh, best decision. 
And uh, when it comes to bringing the team together, so now the other thing which I also see with my consulting project is, so let's bring some 25 people together in a room and to make this decision. So that's a red flag. It doesn't work. So the research by Bain Consulting says that the number of t- optimum number of people in the team to make a decision mm-hmm. is seven. And if you bring the eighth person to the room, the decision-making effectiveness reduces by 10%. Ninth person, again, 10 more percent. So don't go with more than seven people in the room and make sure that these seven people are real experts. So that's where, uh, Rick, to your point, is about uh, trade-offs and everything can be balanced by bringing the right SMEs to the table. Data analytics is one option, which I said about the actionable insights decision. But how do you make real decisions is about working on these four components and bringing the right SMEs to the table. Well, I think that's a topic that you've actually certainly like talked about in other episodes as well, but that you've, um, Prashant, have been talking to, or at least in parallel to this entire podcast is um, part of creating a sense of data maturity and advancing an organization does take bringing in SMEs and creating a culture around it as well, setting up the, the people in the process um, around how you can actually put this and bring it together, how you can move it forward and getting people excited, get, like, teaching them how to use it so they're not just relying on those um, static reports, PowerPoints and spreadsheets and everything. So what would you define as a good data culture for, um, for an organization looking to advance? Or, and would you define it differently depending on what stage of maturity these organizations Amazing, are? amazing question, Aaron. So the first thing is about data analytics, is all great ml and ai is all good but first you need to understand where you are currently standing in the organization just because in some flight magazine you heard that netflix is doing this and uh, uber is doing this doesn't mean that you are you are capable of doing this so first thing is you have to see where you are currently standing in the data and analytics maturity i say it uh, like in a i tell uh, i have a line which says that there is no point in preaching religion to a hungry man so you, you need to know where you are standing. Like for somebody who is on a wheelchair, if you show him that, hey, you know, Usain Bolt is running like this, it's actually humiliating to him, right? It's insulting to this person. So you need to know where you are standing in the data analytics maturity life cycle. Gartner did a study and they say that 87% of the companies are in the maturity cycle of one and two on a scale of one to five. So many of the organizations, though they aspire to do ML and AI and all those things, they are constrained with poor data culture, data literacy, poor quality data, all those stuff which are which are hampering their uh, hampering their growth or journey to the advanced stages of the data and analytics life cycle. So that's one thing. Now the root cause of all those things is, of course, data culture, and one of the ways to improve data culture is data literacy. But many people have asked me, what is this data culture? How do you build this data culture? So, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, reports which have been done, uh, McKinsey and uh, uh, Bain and all those big companies have done this research. But I have three recommendations for how to build a data culture. The first one is have a mentality to serve somebody. Like treat everybody in your company as a customer. So in the whole value chain, doesn't have a customer doesn't mean always that somebody who pays for your product and services. Treat everybody as a customer. So what? So why, what does it happen and how it is related to data? Because you need a point of reference and that point of reference comes from data. So you need to say, this is my this is my baseline and this is the way I'm going to improve my performance. You need a reference point and that reference point will be on data. So if you think somebody to, uh, if you want somebody, uh, if you want to serve somebody, you want to have a baseline, that baseline comes from data. Next number two, data and analytics is all about performance improvement. So I was asked by a VP of an oil company, hey Prashant, can data and analytics help me get more oil from the ground? The answer is no. For that, you need a pump check. But if you want to look at the performance of the pump check, then you need data and analytics. Mm-hmm. So bottom line is data and analytics provides visibility and visibility drives performance. So you need to believe in this, uh, that I want to do performance improvement. I want to improve every day. If you don't want to, uh, if you're not believing in this data, the data culture is not there. And the third one is about consensus-based decision-making. I believe that I have some skills, others also have some skills. So let's put all our skills together on insights together to make a better decision. Not because I am a VP or not because I am a CEO or I started this company. 
it be, uh, believe that everybody has that kind of knowledge and skills to make the decision. So data culture, in my view, again, is three things. One is service mentality. Next, number two, continuous performance improvement. And last three is about a consensus-based culture. I'm speechless. Absolutely. It's all insights working, from like, the tranches, right? Like working workers, with the uh, clients and coming up with the um, area. <laughs> Uh, you know, the data to the performance, like you said, right, how, how the insights affect performance. Uh, it's so true. I mean, you know, the whole industry runs on cost per mile as the only metric that defines the success of a logistics company. And, and there are so many insights or factors that go into increasing the cost per mile or decreasing it. And, and you know, uh, if, if you know what that end state should be, uh, then everything should be driven towards that. And that that data culture, at least in that industry, is very prevalent, you know, because they have these strict metrics. And it's very simple compared to oil and gas or, you know, uh, the other uh, manufacturing industries where you have a lot more factors. Uh, in, in the industry, like transportation, it's very simple in that sense that you can easily build that data culture, as an example, right? <clears throat> And, and in fact, you know, one of our customers, beautiful mm. uh, data mm. culture uh, that they've Excellent. built over yeah. like four or five years now. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a beacon uh, and an example, you know, for the other ones, for sure. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Good to know, Rick. Yeah. 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 Well, um, we only have a couple minutes left, but um, one of the things, Prashant, that I would say is my big takeaway from this <laughs> podcast is that I feel like I have um, earned a mini certificate in data analytics from the number of tips and frameworks that you have provided. I feel like I could listen to everything that you just said 10 times on a very slow pace and just have to write it out over and over again, and I would be just a little bit further. Um, on my way there, but you've, you've gone over so much um, in this and you have so much experience working with um, industries and companies that are at different levels of their, their data maturity. So if there was one tip that you could give to a company that this is the area that they should start with, this is the area that they could focus, that you think that would really help them just take like, a combination of um, everything that they put together in building a data culture and really help them get to those actionable insights, what would that tip be? Um, you know, like, again, I would start with focus on the customer. So if you, if you have a customer, most of the things will fall in place. So, uh, and, uh, so that's one thing because their needs and what you do, everything aligns with, the. Uh, um, uh, aligns with the needs of the customer. So one thing is focus on the customer, his needs, his value propositions, and uh, mm -hmm. and, and and you don't have to think customer is always somebody, like for example, you might be in uh, HR, for example, you might think, oh, oh, this is not my role, where is the customer? So treat your employees because that's where you are providing your service as their customer, so that they in turn will take that same mentality, mindset to the real customers. So treat everybody whom you're serving as your uh, as your customer. That's the number one uh, advice I have. And then based on that, then a lot of things, data quality, data culture, many things will fall in place. <laughs> I think, no, I mean, that's, it's obviously, it's a great place to start. And I think it's a, it's a wonderful mm -hmm. sentiment to, um, to have and to really think about as you're considering bringing this in or not even considering, I think it's inevitable that everybody is bringing this in um, at this point. Um, well, Prashant, it was great having you um, on the podcast today. Really enjoyed the conversation. I know I personally got a lot of got a lot of value um, out of it, and really appreciated the the detail and the stories that you had to share. Perfect. Thanks, Erin and Drake. Thanks for your time, and uh, looking forward to see the podcast uh, going live and uh, hearing from uh, the customers and prospects of ValueServe well, what they have to say about this. Access the full episode of Decisions Now on our website. And don't forget to subscribe to Decisions Now podcast today.